One of my favorite things from my childhood is this Pascal Fourier synthesizer. It generates sine waves at integer multiples of the same frequency, and you can adjust the amplitude and phase of each one. So I've got a speaker connected up here so that I can hear the sound, and I've got an oscilloscope here so that I can see it, and I've got a high bandwidth Keysight Allegiscope, which is a very modern device that emulates what an oscilloscope does at, at much higher bandwidth uh, and allows you to see radio frequencies and so on. But for this experiment, it almost seems better to use the same oscilloscope that I used in my childhood, which is this Ico oscilloscope kit. And I've inside here, I've placed also a clear, transparent cathode ray tube so that you can see the waveform uh, on this tube. And it's just a big bottle of nothing, you know, it's just a big uh, empty glass tube. And on the back of it, there's a filament, a heater, just like a light bulb, basically. And uh, the, But it also has a, a an anode in here uh, that's about 2,600 volts, 2,600 volts higher potential than the, than the filament here. And so it shoots these electrons at the screen, at this phosphor screen, and allows us to see the image while the electrons are being deflected by these deflection plates, which are driven by this vacuum tube amplifier. These two tubes here uh, produce uh, the deflection voltage, uh, and they, that they're the output of these two tubes over this twin lead. So the signal comes in here, gets amplified by the first stage, goes down the twin lead, gets amplified by the second stage, and deflects the beam to create the pattern. Uh, and this is in the vertical direction, and the horizontal direction is on a time base. And so uh, this allows us to see, as well as we can hear it on the speaker here, this this waveform. And you can see this is just a glass bulb in here, basically, that's putting that image onto the screen. And so now, if I adjust these various harmonics in just the right way, I've got, this is the fundamental, 440 vibrations per second. This is the second harmonic, 880. Third harmonic, four times that, that frequency, five times that frequency, six times that frequency, seven, eighth, and ninth harmonic, 3,940 vibrations per second. And if I adjust these in just the right ratio, let me turn on the first harmonic, full, and then if I put the second harmonic, double the frequency, you can see it changes the shape the shape of the wave, and I can adjust the phase and amplitude. This knob here controls the phase, and this knob here controls the amplitude of that second harmonic. But let's leave the second harmonic exactly zero and adjust the third harmonic to one-third of the amplitude, one-third of the way up, and leave the fourth to zero and adjust the fifth to one-fifth of the way up, and adjust the phase appropriately so it's centered, and then leave the sixth to zero, adjust the seventh to one seventh the way up, and adjust the ninth harmonic to a ninth of the way up. And you can see here, I've got, if I adjust them in just the right way, it'll create what's approximately a square wave. That uh, looks, you know, approximately, it's emulating what a square wave does. It's these, this is the Fourier harmonics, this is the first, uh, one, two, three, four, five. This is the first five uh, terms of a Fourier series, and these five sine waves that I've selected are these nine possible sine waves. These five that I've chosen in the right amplitude and phase can add up together to approximate a square wave. And uh, if I turn these off, I can turn each of these individual harmonics off. And then if I turn on an actual true square wave, you can see this square wave looks and sounds very, very much like the Fourier constructed square wave from the fundamental, the third harmonic, fifth, seventh, and ninth harmonic. And we can create various sorts of wave shapes. I can, for example, I can turn down some of these and let's say what happens if I put only the eighth and ninth harmonic together. There's the ninth and the eighth. And you can see this pattern here. I get this sort of beat frequency effect when I put only the eighth and ninth. And if I put only the seventh and eighth, I get this beat frequency. And if I put only the sixth and seventh, I get this frequency, this pattern. And if I put only the 
fifth and sixth, I get this and so on. So you can see all these different patterns if I put a whole bunch of them on. I can get various kinds of waveforms, various periodic waveforms that can be synthesized. So that's why we call this a Fourier synthesizer, this device here. Beautiful device made in 1973. Many happy memories from my childhood playing with this thing and understanding. And it kind of gives us a fundamental understanding of of uh, Fourier theory and how do we how do we understand how these different signals come together. So I want to give everybody an appreciation for the sort of ineffable sense of awe and wonder that I felt from my childhood playing around with these sorts of things. Now when I generate a sine wave here, you know, just an individual sine wave, and I can vary the phase of the sine wave as I turn this knob here. When I generate just an individual sine wave, we don't really know whether that's a positive or a negative frequency. In fact, it has equal contribution to positive and negative frequencies when I generate a sine wave. And we could, in Fourier theory originally, we, uh, sines and cosines were considered separately. But in modern Fourier theory, we sort of use the, the, the idea that uh, cos theta plus i sine theta equals e to the i theta. And we think of these things together as a complex valued waveform. So uh, with a complex valued waveform, we can tell the difference between positive and negative frequencies. So what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to turn down the intensity a little bit on the screen. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to turn this, turn this thing off here. And I've got another signal generator down here, which is a complex valued signal generator. It has two outputs, a real and imaginary output, so that I can, I can uh, put this onto the oscilloscope here. I'm going to put in uh, this signal generator right here, and I've got it set to fairly low frequency at the moment, and, um, and then I'm going to put, I'm going to change it into XY mode, so I'm going to put the the uh, other axis to external. Now what you see now is that it's going around in a circle because what we've got is we've got, and I just got to adjust the gains of the two channels uh, approximately the same. It's going around in a circle more or less because what's happening is I'm feeding a cosine wave into the x-axis and a sine wave into the y-axis. And this uh, instrument is a little bit out of calibration. Uh, it was made in 1959, so it's uh, old enough now that it's, it needs to be recalibrated to get it to work exactly linearly. But you can see the general idea. And so this is a positive frequency. It's going counterclockwise. So to understand the concept of negative frequencies, let's reverse the x and the y, the role of sine and cosine. So now what happens is this thing will be going the other way now. So this thing is now going clockwise. So that's a negative frequency. So this is an important concept. This is the concept of negative frequency. This, this uh, thing is going clockwise. And in fact, to distinguish the difference between positive and negative frequencies, this scope here, a modern scope, goes up to 1.5 gigahertz. But it struggles, even with this 5 hertz wave, to tell the difference between plus 5 hertz and minus 5 hertz. And if I get this up to about... Uh, uh, 15 or 20 hertz, the scope cannot tell the difference between positive and negative frequencies. So it has an actual useful bandwidth as a graph drawing machine of only about uh, 20 hertz or so, even though it's got a 1.5 gigahertz bandwidth for grabbing RF signals and displaying them later and so on. These modern scopes don't do very well in XY plots compared to an older scope. The electron beam here, of course, responds uh, almost infinitely fast. You know, it'll uh, go up to millions of times per second in terms of its response. It's, it's almost infinity in terms of continuous analog response. So that's an important uh, difference. That's one of the benefits of a true analog 
oscilloscope is the ability to see and understand these XY plots and to see the <clears throat> the waveforms in real time. Let me turn off the lights so we can really see that. an original composition called the Code Cert in honor of the code of ethics that uh, Professor Steve Mann wants to lead tomorrow and discuss a uh, set of terms for the future of humanistic augmentation. And so without further ado, I will bring up Professor Steve Mann, the Splash Tones, and their remarkable, unique work. My name is Steve Mann, and this is a hydrolophone underwater pipe organ. So we'll start just by, when I cover up the finger holes, the water's blocked, and that sends it through the whistle, and that makes a sound. Mm -hmm. So now I want to play movement two, which is the piece entitled Adagio for Pascal Fourier Synthesizer. The Pascal Fourier synthesizer is right here. And as you can see on the allegiscope, they, they call it an oscilloscope, but I like to call them allegiscopes to distinguish from real oscilloscopes with cathode ray tubes. And so this Fourier synthesizer only plays one note. It can only play an A440. So this entire piece is going to involve sounding only one note, A440. But varying its different harmonics. So Pascal Fourier synthesizer is a device which, you know, I remember, you know, from years ago, was used in teaching physics classes in universities and schools and that sort of thing. So now I'm going to bring us here You can watch the oscillo, the uh, legislature here. Thank you. 